Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Deb Hackathorn. I'm a principal with Frost Brown Todd in Government Relations. I also proudly serve as the chair of the CMC Board of Trustees. For those of you joining us by live stream today, we are coming to you from our home in Columbus's historic Italian village, the Ellis. If you scan the QR codes at your table, you will also see the many organizations that support your not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club. Thank you to the sponsor of today's special forum, WOSU Public Media. We also want to thank our host, The Ellis, for their generous support for today's program. We're grateful to the presenting sponsor of our live stream, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and our live stream partner, the Columbus Dispatch. Please join me in thanking all of our supporters. So welcome to today's forum, a special conversation with Senator Joe Manchin, senior senator from the great state, our neighbor, West Virginia. Joe Manchin was sworn into the United States Senate on November 15th, 2010, to fill the seat left vacant by the late Senator Robert C. Byrd. Born and raised in the small coal mining town of Farmington, West Virginia, Senator Manchin served as a West Virginia state legislator, as the Secretary of State, as the Governor of West Virginia, before stepping into his current role as the state's senior U.S. Senator. His appearance today at CMC comes as part of a national listening tour supported by the nonprofit organization Americans Together. It is my great honor, then, to introduce today's distinguished speakers. Please give a very warm CMC welcome to the Honorable Joe Manchin, Senior U.S. Senator from the state of West Virginia. And to our host today, our friend Karen Kassler, from the Bureau Chief from the State House News Bureau. Karen, welcome back to CMC. We look forward to the conversation. It's always great to be here. And thank you all so much for being here on a Thursday at 2 o'clock, which I know is a little bit breaking the schedule, but this is the reason why. So let's get right to it, if you don't mind, Senator. First, let me just say sure. thank you to uh, Columbus. I appreciate it very much. We just came from Cleveland, had a great, uh, great meeting this morning. Uh, I've seen two of my fellow West Virginians that I've watched grow up and know them when they're very young, Kim Vogel here, and her mom and dad's very close to me. And I got Colin uh, Flaherty back there, and Tom and Paul are very close. So it's good to see people from back home. A lot of West Virginia connections here, and I thank all of you. Appreciate it. Well, you mentioned that you were in Cleveland this morning, and you're going to be in uh, Michigan next week. You've been in New Hampshire. Let's just get this out on the table right now. Are you running for president? <laughs> I'm glad we worked up to that one. <laughs> Uh, here's the thing, I'm not running for anything right now. <laughs> and the reason I say that is what we're trying to do is find out where the country is going and why everyone seems to be so uh, disenfranchised, why they don't feel like they're part of something and they can't grab hold because if you look at the polls and you believe what you say, you handicap today uh, the election would be between a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. That's the handicap. And when you talk to the Democrat Party or Republican Party or people that are identified as D's and R's, uh, they don't seem to be that enamored with it. But yet there's no breakthrough. Well, what's happened? Why is the system so closed? Uh, how come the political process is not more open and more people can participate? And there might be more choices. So we're talking about that. And we'll be talking about ranked choice voting or majority voting. Uh, I think that if it wasn't for that, my good dear friend Lisa Murkowski, Republican in Alaska would not have been reelected. And Lisa Murkowski is one of the best legislators you could ever have in Washington, D.C. And you can't, you just got to quit looking at the other side. Just because you have an, uh, an identification of a D or an R doesn't mean you're the enemy. Doesn't mean the other side is, you have to destroy them. It means that they might have a different idea how to fix the problem. And we'll get into this more in detail, but what I saw last week just discouraged me more than anything I've ever seen. We had uh, the greatest crisis we have right now is the border. And I mean that because anybody that's watching what's going on and knowing how many people are coming through the border uh, is, is extremely dangerous because we haven't been able to vet them. We've got millions of people that have come, and I would like to think they all came for the right reason, but I know they didn't. And we know we got a lot of drugs still coming in. We got a lot of criminals coming through, and that should have been caught and stopped. So if you want to blame Joe Biden, go ahead because it's his fault. And I've told him that. I told Mr. President, you're, I, I've been opposed to your uh, border, border uh, laws, if you will, since day one. 
And now he'll come back and say, well, I did it because of humanitarian reasons. And because after the pandemic, the world's in a flux. They never thought they'd get overrun the way they have. Now it's his responsibility to fix it. And you know what? We had a fix, a bipartisan fix. Democrats and Republicans, the most conservative Republican, the most decent human being that we have in all of Congress, James Langford from Oklahoma, no one ever thought he would get to an agreement to a piece of legislation, which he did. And then my Republican colleagues walked away, and they were the one demanding it. And I'm thinking, I always felt that we could uh, legislate through a crisis. I knew that we'd become dysfunctional. I saw that when I got there in, in December uh, of 2010. But I said, we can always rise to the occasion for a crisis. And so I've said before, we've been paralyzed, but now we're broken. If you can't come to a crisis and identify the crisis and you let politics scare you away, and you have a candidate says, and Donald Trump saying, uh, I don't think we ought to fix it right now because I'm going to need that for November. That's worse than Joe Biden doing what he did three years ago. So how do you reckon with that? How, what do you do? Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's my purpose for coming out and finding out how we can either bring these parties, the grand old party and the Democrat party, which has always been responsible and compassion, how can you bring them back to the center left, center right? That's where we make our decisions and how we live our lives. We don't, this is not normal game. This is not normal. I've been around for 40, 42 years now. I've never seen what I'm seeing today, and I'm more concerned than I've ever been. When you say you're not running right now, <laughs> let's just fix on that for a second. Uh, you, you mentioned the Trump-Biden possible rematch, which polls show most Americans don't want. Uh, all the things that you just said right there, what would be the circumstances that would potentially get you into this race? And if you did, who would be your running mate? Well, the bottom line is, it's, it's uh, yeah, I was a kid. Uh, we'll get into that because I'm going to the question in Cleveland. They must have called you. I watched. I watched. <laughs> anyway, uh, my purpose of coming around and being here is not to propose or propel me running for any office. I said I'm not running for re-election for the U.S. Senate, and uh, I'm not out here running on any party for any other office. They said, well, there might be an opening run as a third party. That's a very, very, very difficult situation. You know, and is there ever a chance that we might be able to open up to where a third party could be more competitive? We need to examine that because the more competition, the better participation you get and you bring more people into the process. That's something we can do. Americans together, my daughter, where's Heather? Heather's right there, my daughter back. She's running Americans. She put it all together. And this Americans together is basically giving people options of how you can change your political dynamics when you feel like you've got no voice and you've got no, uh, no home. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're, we're really promoting. And that's why I'm here. And the hypothetical, I said this, I'll give you an example. Mitt Romney's a very dear friend of mine. We work very close together. We've both been governors together. We know each other very well, and we're friends. One has an R by their name, one has a D by their name. So just like this, the press was seeing, he and I, Wednesday night, we were, after we got done voting, I said, well, let's, let's, let's go down and we have what we call the Styles, the Styles room. That's a room where just senators only. Staff can't come, nobody can, it's just us. Everything's off limit. It's a very, very nice place. We walk in there and we just, he and I were there, we were sitting down, but as we were going in, the press says, well, what are you guys, what are you scheming up? I says, we're deciding on running for president. We can't figure out who should run and who should be the vice president. So we're gonna go in here and flip a coin. And they all get, oh my goodness, sir. And I says, the only problem about Mitt, he has a two-headed coin and I don't trust up in the coin with him. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun with that, but there are so many good people, there really are. And uh, you know, I'm gonna support what I think the best person who has the character and the demeanor to basically put their country above the party and the party or someone in the party can't intimidate them to vote for something they know is wrong. Just because it says we might not support you again. And I will say this, it might be shocking to you, this is not the best job I've ever had. And uh, why I see some people sell their soul for it, I can't believe, just cannot, can't comprehend. Why would you do that? I was there when I first got there, I asked Pat Leahy, been there for 50 years. And I just came off of being governor, which I will tell you this is the greatest job you could ever have. And the reason I say that, because you can change somebody's life every day 
You can help people. Man, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning. I didn't want to go to bed at night because I wanted to do something. I want to get, 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 we say, get crap done. I I want to get things done. So uh, I asked Pat, I said, Pat, is there a special club I don't know about? And Pat Leahy says, what's, why would you say that, Joe? And I says, I'm watching the way you people are voting, and I don't know how you're doing and voting this way. You can't explain it, so there must be a club you're afraid of getting thrown out. He says, you'll figure it out. I figured it out. There's no, there's no club, and I just think they're running scared. So are you ready to tell people who you might vote for? I haven't made my mind up. I truly haven't. I know who I'm not going to vote for. Who's that? <laughs> Donald Trump. But you haven't made your mind up I to haven't vote made for my mind Joe up. Biden. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about uh, Americans Together, this uh, group that is organizing this listening tour. You said the reason I want to say that, I, I, better, I better clarify that. <laughs> I, know, I know Mr. Donald Trump, and I've worked with him, and I try to think, well, you know, I like some of the things he's, he wants to do and he has done. It's just the way he does them. And then basically coming out in this campaign, saying the things he said. First of all, what he said about John McCain just went through me like n n nothing's ever gone through me before. I knew John McCain. And John McCain, I always said this, if you haven't been McCainanized, you haven't been in the Senate. Because John took on everybody, and he was willing to go to, to go to the mat with you. But John, you had to earn John's respect. And one time he and I got into it, and, uh, and we got pretty hot and, hot and heavy, because I was fighting for National Guard, and John was more of a hardcore military. And he, he never believed the National Guard uh, was the guard he knew of my father's. It wasn't the guard that we have today. All the guards are very, very professional. So we were fighting on that, and he got mad at me. And then I'm thinking, how can, they said, don't worry, it takes about a month or two, he'll get over it. <laughs> well, I was starting talking to him about ships, because I was in charge of uh, land and sea in, in the committee, and we were trying to, how many ships do we need? So I went and talked to John, and John says, Joe, let me, I want to go ahead and apologize. I said, John, you owe nobody an apology for the service you've given to our country. You owe nobody an apology, so please. Let's be friends. And we became very dear friends. And then to watch him denigrate that, and even how he took after Nikki Haley's husband. It's just, these are, this is not, and you don't, you don't call people, this is schoolyard stuff. You don't call people names, and then you expect they want to work with you. You just can't do that. And then you can't tell your allies, and I said, Vladimir Putin knows, knows the value of our NATO allies more than Donald Trump knows the value of our NATO allies. Putin would rather basically destroy our NATO allies that we have, the, the, the relationships we have, because he knows how powerful we are as a country when you have this many countries that have your values, that will fight for your freedoms, and willing to die with you for the freedom and democracies that we have. And to say that, oh, no, if you haven't paid up. I agree, they should pay up, but there's other ways to get them to pay, and they are paying up. And he hasn't taken that in consideration. And if he wants to take credit, thank you for putting it on the table. But the bottom line, to threaten someone that you're going to sick Vladimir Putin on you, if you don't do this, this, and this, the same as he tells me, he's going to use revenge as how he's going to basically govern. And you're telling me that's democracy, that's America, that's who we are? We're the superpower because people have the same values we had, and we have to keep those. And that's why I would not support him. And I would tell him if he was standing here, and I just said, he's just very difficult to work with, period. And this is thought, you know, and uh, Joe Biden has his, he's gone too far left. He's not the Joe Biden I've known forever. He's not the Joe Biden that we voted for. And he's, and I've told him this, I said, how come you've moved so far to the extreme? You've never been there. Can't you come back? I mean, we've got to have energy, and we have to be responsible to the climate. All these things we have to do, but you have to make sure that this country remains a country that the rest of the world wants to follow. We can't be asking for foreign supply chains to take care of us and do things we won't do for ourselves. Those are, that's leadership, so that's my reason. <laughs> Glad you clarified. I'll make them shorter than that now. <laughs> Uh, Americans Together, this group that you're working on uh, that, that's putting together this listening tour, uh, you've said before that there's this tribalism, the uh, R's and D's, and that if you're not on one team, the other is the enemy. There's also lots of misinformation and disinformation. How do you combat this, and, and how do you do it now in I'm a— I want to say this, and yeah. I, 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 she knows what, how I feel very strongly <laughs> about this. People ask me, so where do you get your news from? Because I says, I don't know how the average public gets your news today. I know how your children and grandchildren get it, and it's not where you probably get it or I get it. But the bottom line is, where do you get the facts? So I tell people this. If you really want to hear the facts, 
go to NPR, go to PBS, okay? And then go to BBC if you want world facts. That's where I'll give it to you un, 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 unfiltered. You make your own mind up. And the net news networks are really good. And some of the top papers, are, they're all. But as far as the, uh, the uh, social media uh, or the cable news, uh, they're not. They're going to give you a slant because they're playing to a certain audience. I respect that as a business model, but it's not good in this age where disinformation is kind of taking the lead. And you're entitled to your opinion. You're just not entitled to create your facts to support your crazy opinion. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words about NPR and PBS. It's the truth. I will not say that, and I know that Karen thinks I'm pleasure. I'm not playing to the audience here. No. I said that unsolicited. I really feel very strongly about that. But I, I do want to ask you about how do you break through this partisanship that's out there? How, and, and is this the time to talk about that with so much at stake? Democracy is potentially at, at stake here. here. You are, you're not that divided. I, I will tell you, if you ask, what do you think about the, the board? Do you think it needs to be fixed? How many thinks that? We all do. Okay, the board is serious. It's a serious thing we face. How about gun violence? How many think we should do something common sense of guns? Okay, so you start to asking questions that we all can agree on. How come we can all agree here, but they can't agree in Washington? They're afraid of losing your vote. They're not hearing enough. They don't know. They're just hearing from the extremes. The extremes are saying, I mean, I come from Kim, uh, Colin, they know. We come from a gun culture state. In West Virginia, if you don't have a gun when you come, you're going to have one when you leave. We'll give you one. <laughs> we want to make sure you can protect yourself. But we're going to teach you how to use it. We're going to make sure you have some common sense and what we call gun sense. But it's just the way things are. And I just believe I tried to do the Mansion Toomey bill. And all it was after the, after the Sandy Hook shooting, you know, I, I don't know how, how that would affect other people. It affected me when 20 babies, their parents couldn't have an open casket because of the absolute, utterly destruction, these little babies, because of the weapons. There's no need for that, okay? But if you say, I'm gonna ban this, I'm gonna ban it, okay? Then people get, oh, you're not taking that away from me. That's my rights, Second Amendment rights. No, I'm not gonna ban it. I'm just gonna make sure that you're a person who is worthy of having it. You're a person who has basically the ability We've, we've tested you. We know that you can. You've paid an, a, a, an extra fee because this is something you're either a sportsman or you're a collector or whatever. But some of these weapons are on the street today. Don't need to be there for every Tom, Dick, and Harry. You can get on a sane asylum today and go buy one tomorrow. That kind of thing has to stop. Red flag laws and all this, and then you have concealed carry, and cops are telling you, says, my God, you're sending us into the shootout the OK Corral. Everyone's got a gun hidden somewhere. When they pull the gun out, who knows what happened yesterday at the, at the Super Bowl parade. This is ridiculous. And I don't know how you feel. I've got 10 grandchildren. I'm scared to death one of them tell me, we're going to go to the game tonight and watch a game. We're going to go with mom and dad. We're going to go with, with, uh, with Jimmy, my, my best friends. We're going to go with his parents uh, to see a movie. I'm scared to death whenever they're going anywhere. Because it, it's, just, it's just a crapshoot. Thank God they can come home safe. That's not the America that I would grew up in. And should we fix it? We should try. And without taking away anyone's rights. But there's, you know, there's, there's laws that we have, and people should have to have certain types of, uh, and certain types of weapons uh, should be showing that you have the capability to do it, and you're a mature person, and you're not, and you're mentally, uh, mentally stable. And I imagine that's some of what you're hearing on your hearing American together. When you together. raise your hands, we'll, I can ask you a dozen questions. F financial responsibility. Country's $33.8 trillion in debt. You can't, just our generation can't sustain this much longer. Think about your children and grandchildren. Think about 2050, where we'll be. Ten, you know, we're going to be close to, if we're going at this rate, close to $100 trillion of debt. No way you can sustain it. And any modern, any... Any government, any type of uh, empire going back to civilization has been brought down because of finances. The people refuse to support the debt that's been incurred upon them. Let me ask you a little bit more about Americans Together. This is a group that you and your daughter have put together to try to... She's, the, she's spearing it, and we have a team here with us, so everybody's doing... Jonathan's back there. Where's Garner's back there? We got them all here. Uh, they're working their tails off on this, trying to give people options and how, we, how can we can help you. 
Now, this is a dark money group. Mm -hmm. You're not required to disclose your donors. Correct. We here in, here in Ohio have gotten a little suspicious of dark money groups because well, you of be. I'm suspicious of <laughs> certain energy laws and certain indictments and certain federal trials. Uh, so, and you've even said yeah. yourself that you support campaign finance reform. Oh, absolutely. So, are you going to disclose your donors? I will when everybody else does. <laughs> Here's the thing about it. they should be. Basically, transparency, okay, from that standpoint. And then especially, I've always said in campaigning, when, when Citizens United came in, it basically came in because they thought that businesses got tired of saying, labor's got the upper hand. Labor can have all these political packs. They can raise all this money against us that we can never win. And all you had to do is say, fine, we're going to have a fairness and balance in the system. Labor and businesses would have had the same ability to have packs. They went over to the Supreme Court to get Citizens United, which says that a corporation is the same as a private citizen and was able to spend unlimited. And then they had the 501c3s, as you know, the public, and then 501c4s. But there are certain things you can and can't do with them. But still yet, I think that everything should be transparent. I'd be happy to do that. But right now, we're the smallest of a 501c4. If you knew the size of the 501c4s of the Democrat and Republican, Remember this, these are not political parties anymore the way we thought we grew up with political parties. These are high-end businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses, the Democrat business and the Republican business in Washington. And it's a business entity, if you will. And I can tell you, you know what, you know what the commodity is? Dysfunction, hate, all the things that we say, because if I can get you to turn on them, you're gonna give more to me. My business model is much better if you don't like the other side. And the more I can make you dislike the other side, the better my business model does. And that's just not who we are. They were based on policy. George Washington said in 1796, beware the political parties before they will usurp the power from the people. It's exactly what's happening. So do we take it back? If we can do that from Americans together to show you how to grab it again, whether it's going to be in how you set your primaries up, the quality of the candidates, and that means everything, the character, and one more thing about candidates. When people are asking you, I sure want you to support me and I sure need you to give me a contribution, a donation. I wish you would say this. I don't give contributions or donations to politicians, but I'm willing to make an investment. What should I expect from my investment? What are you going to do for me and my country? Make them, just put us on the spot. Find out if the person's really in it for themselves. You can tell ambitious people that put their ambitions ahead of basically the purpose of why they're serving. In West Virginia, we can shake your hand, look in your eye, and see your soul. It's about all we got is our gut. So we're going to figure out, hey, you, you in it for me or you in it for you? And that's what people do. And right today, I think you're going to have to really dig deep, dig real deep. Another dark money group that you've been tied to is No Labels. And that's a group that had talked about maybe having a presidential ticket put together if there was a Trump-Biden rematch. What's going on with No well, Labels? Still, I think they're still out there doing everything they possibly can. I, got, I, got, I supported No Labels, still do. I know all the people involved there. And that started way back in 2010. When I first got elected, I got elected to the United States Senate after Bob Byrd died, Robert C. Byrd. He died in June. I thought I could just appoint for the next two years and stay in my, finish my second term as governor. But it came to the point where I couldn't because he died outside of the Constitution window. He was longer than two years from the next general election. So I had to appoint somebody and then run for a special election. And I had served the last two years of his term. Now I, I served then. I won in 2012 for a full term, 2018. And uh, uh, no labels. When I went there, I, I thought, well, boy, I'm, I'm going to the big leagues now because I've been a governor and I was head of the National Governors Association. And I swear to you, I could not... I could not walk in to a governor's meeting where there were 50 of us. I could not tell you who were Democrats and Republicans if I didn't look at their resume because we all had the same problems and we were all trying to help each other. It wasn't, I'm not going to talk to you because it might help. No, Jeb Bush, he really got involved with us in education in West Virginia. We worked together. Uh, Mitt Romney, my buddy up in, up in, uh, in Massachusetts at the time, worked with us on health care. We had no problems calling. They called me on crisis, and we had mine disasters, and they were having disasters. We would help them through it. No one ever said, well, I, I, I can't help you because you're on the other side, okay? We traveled together. We went over to overseas together. We did everything together. And now, all of a sudden, I says, well, I'm really going to the big time now. I've been, I've been uh, into the uh, AAA ball, but now I'm going to the majors. Well, guess what? I think I went back to the, the uh, Little League. 
because uh, I got up there and it was just so dysfunctional. And they were the only avenue I had to sit down with a venue that I could meet Republicans and have that same collegiality with them that I had when I was a governor. And I missed that. So I've tried to keep that. And I've always uh, tried to keep Democrats and Republicans. I invite them to go dinner. And I'll give you one more thing. I live on a boat, I do, when I'm in Washington. And people say, why do you live on a boat? And I said, I never wanted to be tied down to D.C. And when things get so damn, <laughs> when things get bad, I can just pick up that old anchor or take them ropes off the, off the dock and just float away. And I still intend to do that. <laughs> but once again, with no labels, like with other dark They're money groups. To put something together. Yeah, but they have a lot of Republican donors, as we've the been told, with, or their backers. I mean, is that a group to try to get Trump elected? Oh, I don't think so. Not the group, not the people I know is involved there. No, very much so not. But they've said it might, ha it might help him and hurt. The thing of it is, Joe Biden doesn't have a strong base. Let's face it. I mean, we, I know what's going on there. His base is not strong. It's very fluid, okay? Donald Trump has a very strong base of anywhere from 26, 27 to about 30. Very strong. You can't move him. So they're saying if you are going to move somebody, you're going to move Joe Biden's people more than you are Donald Trump's people. If they're responsible, reasonable people, I think those who haven't made their mind up are those who are holding their nose. I've got people that Republicans says, uh, I, I don't like Donald Trump, but boy, if that's what I got, I might have to vote for him. I, got, I hear that. I've got people that says I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump no matter what. I'll vote for Joe Biden in a wheelchair before I would Donald Trump. I hear that. I hear a little bit of everything back and forth, and none of them seem to be enamored of what they have. But the system is producing what the business model wants you to that's, that's your options. It's like going in and you only have one couch or two couches to choose from. Which one do you want? Not, not a big variety. There are 50 members of Congress. Oh, go ahead. One thing about here on, on when you say dark money. Dark money does two things. Dark money, first of all, protects a lot of the people who are giving for a cause they believe in but don't want to be targeted, okay? But what dark money shouldn't do provide you from providing a mission statement, that's all you can do. So that's what the 501c4 is. You have to have a mission statement, only so much the money go go for this or this. And that's where you should be held accountable. If you're trying to protect the people who don't want to be harassed because they might be given to something you don't agree with, but they're still good people, they just believe differently, that's been a, there's a purpose for that. There are 50 members of Congress who are not running for re-election. Uh, seven senators, um, five of them are, are Democrats, like you. Um, the people who are going to be running for your seat, there's a very high likelihood that it's going to be a pretty uh, partisan candidate who's going to win that race. Is, are you hurting the Democrats by not running just, for your seat again? Everyone says, why aren't you running? Because I know I could get elected and I don't want to have another six-year sentence. Isn't that awful? <laughs> and I'd be pretty old at that time, too. Maybe, maybe it's a blessing. I, I just, I, I, I really believe in term limits. I've served enough in that. I've been 14 years in the Senate. I was six years in this, as a governor. I could have served my other two. It had been eight. Uh, I was in House of Delegates. I've been a state senator. I've been Secretary of State. So I've been all these, I've, I've really been able to learn a lot and I've been privileged to be able and honored to serve my great state and have a lot of good people work with me uh, that truly cared. Um, I just, uh, I'll tell you how I come to the conclusion that you should have term limits in America. I was in a, had to be 10 years ago, I was down in Southern West Virginia, I think in, probably in Logan County, I'm thinking where I was, and a lady back there, we had a town hall like this, a couple hundred people, and she says, uh, I really would wish you, Joe, you would support uh, support term limits. And I said, well, I said, I thought about that, but you know, you're going to lose a lot of the quality people, people with experience. And I don't know if we could afford that. And she, I, I gave her everything I had of why I didn't think it was a good idea. She looked at me and she said, Joe, just think about this. If we had term limits, maybe we'd get one good term out of you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I had no comeback. She convinced me. I had no, she's absolutely correct. So I have been for term limits, and I will tell you, this is my term limits. I'd have the United States Supreme Court one 18-year term, one 18. I'd have the President of the United States one six-year term, just one six-year term. I'd have Senate two six-year terms, and I'd have the uh, House uh, uh, Congress six two-year terms. And that's more than enough. It was never intended to be a livelihood. It was never intended to be happy retirement home. And I guarantee you, you go up in Washington, 
you vote no 80 to 90 percent of the time, it's the hep happy retirement home. You can stay forever. You don't have to explain a no vote. Someone's always mad and glad you did it. You've got to work to explain why you voted yes. But to get something like that passed, I mean... That's going to be movements from here. It's not going to happen in Washington. The business model will not allow that in. Think about this in the business model. How can a person with the name of Kennedy, with the name of Kennedy and lineage to John F. Kennedy, can't even participate in Democratic primary? Whether you like him or not, whether his politics are crazy, whatever, but just having the opportunity to participate in a Democratic primary and not having that option. Now, you tell me it's not a closed system. We have one more question for me before we turn it over to the audience and our live stream to get uh, their thoughts and the things they want to ask you. So I have one more question for you. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, foreign aid package in the U.S. Senate, the $95 billion package for Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel, and the Palestinians in Gaza. And uh, it, 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 it yes. So uh, you've got some people, Republicans, who are turning against it. Um, our Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance says that if it passes, it could lead to Donald Trump being impeached again because if he's reelected, it deals with funding in Ukraine. It's a complicated issue, I guess, here. But he, you've got Republicans who are turning against this. How do you get this passed? Why vote for it? Well, first of all, I'm not going to speak about anybody's senators because you, know, you all have elected them, so they're your senators. You got to make sure you got to get the type of representation you want. Uh, I will say that Rob Portman is a dear friend of mine, and it was a great loss to, the, to, it was a great loss to America, a great loss to the Senate and I'm sure to Ohio. Sherrod Brown is, 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 uh, is sincere. He's, he's further left than I am, okay? But you can work with him. You can sit down and talk to him. J.D. is very sharp, very bright, but he's, he's, he is what you just described, okay? And uh, I, 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 can't, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, I can tell you this on the aid. I support Ukraine 1,000%. It's the best investment the United States has ever made, and I think it's the most honorable war or war effort that we've ever been involved in in my lifetime. I remember Vietnam, I know Iraq and Afghanistan and all, everything in and in between, all the skirmishes we've been in. This is the one that makes the most sense for us, stopping the atrocity of Putin with his quest to bring Mother Russia back together, which we fought for liberation through the World War II and the fascists, and then basically end up where the world did. And then after the Iron Curtain came down, it is what it is. He wants to put all that back if he could. He won't stop there. And here's a country, Ukraine, that basically is willing to fight and sacrifice their own blood for assistance that we would have and technology to help them show that Mother Russia is not the big bad power that they thought they were and selling themselves to the rest of the world. They have lost so many troops and they have paid a horrific price. And these people are willing to sacrifice to continue to have what we have and take for granted. And we don't have any. I can assure you, we didn't do anything when he went to Crimea. We never, not one shot was fired in Crimea. He came over into the Donbass area, which is eastern Ukraine. And what we did is we started at that time assisting in training the Ukrainians. We were assisting then. We were told, we were told about a month before the invasion of Ukraine by Putin that it was going to happen. Two things would happen. Xi Jinping would either move on uh, Taiwan or it would happen with, uh, uh, with uh, Putin moving on Ukraine. We were told exactly the day and the time it would happen and, and Putin moved on Ukraine. But they told us it would only last two weeks. They thought exactly uh, that Bolshevik mentality is coming at you with everything they got and they're showing you 400,000 troops with all this hardware military coming at you. Uh, and they just thought they'd scare the bejesus out of everybody, and he would roll over. What they couldn't tell us is what the heart of Zelensky was like as a leader and how he, the people were able to rise up around him and rally. That shows you what leadership does. And with that, if they move through there and they hit the Baltics and they hit the Poland and all of our NATO allies, gang, we're poured into it. Americans' blood will shed. And right now... I don't know where we would be if we'd have just stayed out and not have supported them and allowed him to move. And I guarantee you, he'd have had more Xi Jinping involved. And we've got four countries that we really have what we call countries of foreign concern. They're never going to have our values. And that's going to be Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. They're never, no matter what you do and what you think. And we cannot be supporting by buying goods or depending on our building blocks, things that we need every day to run our country, coming from countries of foreign, of foreign concern. That's it. 
So we're trying to bring that back and do things more for America, what America can do, and we should be leaders. But there was no immigration, no border, uh, border oh, security, no awful. immigration Here's uh, restrictions. Thing. In September, uh, my Republican friends said, and I agreed with them, and I, was, I disagreed with the Democrats who were just trying to push foreign aid only and not secure the border. That was last September. And the Republicans said, hey, Joe, we're not going to even talk about foreign aid until we get, until we really get our, our border secured. Sign me up. I'm with you guys. Democrats are mad at me. I said, no, they're right. I said, we can't ask people to be spending money and helping other people secure borders when we won't secure our own. Fine. Boom. We've got to write a bill. They put James Langford, the most conservative Republican and the most morally solid human being, one of the best character people I've ever met. Solid as can be. We never voted like Harley, okay? But he is that good. And I thought they don't want this to work because the Republicans, Mitch McConnell's putting a person that can't come to a deal because the perfect is always the enemy of the good. It's not perfect enough. And I'm thinking, okay, so I, and James, James is a good friend of mine. I kept James that says, you got to stop catching release. We just can't let people in here because we don't have time to process them or not have the personnel. And we were letting them in by the hundreds of thousands, okay? And I think since Biden's been there, about a million of them have come over through what we call border parole and catch and release. That's got to stop. So he put a bill together and worked on it. It took forever to get it done, but he was so precise. And this is one of the better bills I've ever seen that could actually secure the border. It's not an immigration. It's just a security bill. And then last Sunday, my friends who pushed for all this said, I don't know. I need to look and see this a little bit more. And I said, guys, we've been working on this for a long time. You've seen everything. And it does a lot of great things. Well, I don't know and everything. And then it got to the point where I'm still studying it on Monday and Tuesday. I don't know. I'm getting a lot of pressure and pressure from back home. They got one person, Donald Trump. He says, I want to wait until it helped me in November. Let me tell you, as I said earlier, Joe Biden was wrong on his border policies. He came to the conclusion we're going to shut the border down. So he was wrong. He was trying to fix it. And Donald Trump says, no, we can't fix it because it's not good for the election. That's worse than making a mistake in the first place. So I, I told him, I said, I've never been more discouraged to see people that basically for their own personal politics and letting someone vote for you. I said, he don't own your vote. You own your vote and the people deserve that. So it was just the most discouraging day of my life to watch that happen on Wednesday when they voted it down. And not, now they want to put it back together. Now they're telling me they're going to ha have a discharge on the House. I got a call from my friends, Republican friends, in the House and says, Joe, if we had a discharge, if we vote to discharge it and we put some border stuff back in, what do you think? I said, as far as I'm concerned, do whatever you have to. Just get it passed and give it back to us. I'll vote for whatever you give me. We've got to fix it. Now, there'll be Democrats that say, oh, no, no, no. You already had your chance. Now you don't. That's as bad as not doing it. That's as bad as what the Republicans did. That's what we're fighting all the time. Think of it this way. I want to see a touchdown every time I see a football game. Every play, I want to see a touchdown. I'm pretty happy to see first downs every now and then and maybe work yourself to a touchdown. I want to see you make a basket every time you're playing a basketball game. I like to see you make a few foul shots now and then too and maybe win the game. And I want to see you hit a home run every time you're at bat. Guess what? It doesn't work in sports. It doesn't work in life that way. It's pieces at a time. But here they want to, uh, when I say vote no, you can vote no because it'll never be perfect enough. You can give me a reason. Karen, I just didn't do this. And I know you wouldn't be, you would say, you're right, I didn't like that. And I make you think the whole bill was based around what you didn't like. There was nine things she did like. I didn't tell her about the nine things she liked. I told her about the one thing she didn't like and she'll agree with me. They vote no. Well, it is a long-standing tradition here at CMC to take questions from the audience, both here in the room and also on our live stream. Lainey Cuthbert is curating questions from our live stream audience. So if you have a question, go join Lainey back there. And go ahead, Lainey. First question. All right. Thank you, Karen. Senator, Mindy Wright asks, how do you think elected representatives should balance the following on how they perform their duties? Positions of constituents who voted for them, that's okay. I, I got Positions of constituents who didn't vote for them, political party solution, excuse me, positions, personal beliefs, 
and policy that accomplishes the greatest good for the greatest number. The only thing I can, well, I can answer that, I can only answer it by how I have approached it, and I have felt very comfortable. Uh, as you know, I was caught in the middle. Uh, that was one 50-50 uh, Senate for longer than any time in history of our government, 50-50 for that 117th Congress. We got more accomplished. I was the one independent senator, whether it be a D or an R, that wasn't controlled by a party. And I always said, if I can go home and explain it, I can vote for it. That's all. I didn't care what one side or the other side. And, and here, I knew that you could put enough pressure, the parties could put enough pressure back home to think, Joe just made a bad choice. And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to come home and explain it. So I would explain it. And I said, this is why I voted the way I did, or this is why I'm leaning towards voting a certain way. And I'd give you all my, so if you ask me on the border bill, why did I do it? I voted for the border bill because basically it stopped catch and release. It gave us another, uh, I think 2,700 agents so we could process more. I don't want to close immigration down. We are a nation of immigrants. Look around. We're all here for, by an immigration. I am for sure. And anyway, I said, I want to make sure there's legal immigration continues. Illegal immigration has stopped and it's not going to be incentivizing people to come thinking they can get in one way or another. Now, there's going to be a legal way to do it. So I'll give you my reasons why I did it and why I voted for it, which I think is a heck of a lot better than what we have today. And it's not going to be anybody catching release. You're going to sit there on the border. And we're going to adjudicate you. And I guarantee you, less than 10% of the people that are coming and putting their foot on the border said, I'm threatening my life back home. I got to come in your country. Less than 10% will qualify for the proper reasons. We know that. But you have to keep them there. You can't disperse them and say, we'll round you up and find you eight years later. So I explain that to you. People agree, people don't agree. Why do we give aid to Ukraine? I just gave you my reasons for Ukraine. I think it's the best investment for democracy that we've ever done. If not, we're going to end up fighting this war ourselves. So if you think we spent 70 or $80 billion so far, it's nothing compared if we get into a war what we're going to spend. So I give you my reason. That's the thing. So only thing I can tell you as a person, if I can explain it, I can vote for it. I want your input then I think I've got to work a lot harder. If my constituents back home have been led one direction because they're not given the facts, I'm going to try to give you the facts, and I'm going to tell you how I made my decisions based off of that. And I'll say this to you. If you can't change your mind, you can't change anything. Trust me, I haven't had all the facts right. I've made mistakes, but I've never made one intentionally, trying to harm my country, my constituents, or any part about democracy. Uh, and I've said this, if a person is doing something to mislead people or making a state mistake uh, intentionally trying to revenge or be vindictive or harming people, those people should not be in public service. That's self-service. So you got to make sure you weed that out. So just basically be true. Just go and tell them. So you're going to, we got pressure all the time. I got pressure from parties saying, well, you know, you're a Democrat. If we do this, this, we'll get more support, more people voting that way. If it makes sense, I'm for it. If it doesn't, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And I tell the Republicans the same thing. And they get mad at me because I vote with Republicans. I said, pretty good idea. Pretty good idea. I like it. I'm, I'm for that. So I kind of look at the subject matter and go based on the facts, the best I can do. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorraine McCosker. I am from at one of the Appalachian counties, 32 counties in Ohio. And I have... Um, educated and been engaged in fossil fuel issues for 20 years. Yes. And um, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of you addressing the uh, complexities of Congress and the Senate and the presidency. It's very frustrating as an engaged citizen, knowing the hard work that we need to address um, and it's not being addressed, such as cl climate change. So I'd like to bring up. Um, we're addressing it very well. Okay, well. We're going to. I, I can tell we're going to maybe respectfully agree to disagree, but I'm happy to have this but, conversation. But you certainly have more power than I do, so I think that uh, it's critical. I'm also a volunteer with Save Ohio Parks. It is an advocacy group who has advocated for protecting public lands from fracking in Ohio, and many of that that gas would end up in those LNG terminals that you very much support uh, permitting. Yes, so my question is, as chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, yes, I, am. Um, 
I, I would ask, and I'm very concerned that you have a conflict of interest. And that conflict of interest is um, receiving that money from oil and gas um, during the 2019 to 24 cycle, you took uh, $700,000 from oil and gas. You took funding from pipelines. You took funding from coal. Yeah. So my question, question is, is what? I'm sorry, what? The question is what? My question is, can you address this seemingly conflict of interest yes, for the so for the citizens that are um, wondering who to vote for in this coming well, let year. Let me just tell you this: if you don't have energy security in your country, you're not going to be a superpower. And energy security doesn't mean elimination. You cannot eliminate your way to a cleaner environment. You can innovate it through technology, but you can't tell people stop using it because they won't. The rest of the world has more appetite for energy than ever in the history of the world. Eight billion people now, 600 million don't have any energy at all. A lot of them have first in India. Think about this. Ten years ago, what? Well, we're, I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and talk, and I'll take your question. Thank you very much. We just disagree. No, you have to be. Let, let me answer my question, and we'll be fine, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate it. And the bottom line is you can't stop because you can't stop. It's called global climate. It's not called United States climate. It's not called Ohio climate. It's called global climate. Ninety percent of all emissions will come from one continent, one continent, Asia. In the next 10 years, 90 percent. If we don't innovate through technology, they're going to continue to pollute more than ever before. We have cut our emissions in the last two decades more than ever before. We're producing more energy, and we're investing in clean, green energy more than any country on Earth today. So we're giving you the, the energy you need today, and we're investing in the energy we want for tomorrow. You cannot have dispatchable and intermittent power. You have to have 24-7. Intermittent power, basically, is going to give, maybe give you five or six hours a day. We're investing in more battery storage. We're investing in hydrogen, SMRs. Uh, uh, we're investing in geothermal. All of the things we're investing in has not been matured. It cannot replace what natural gas has been doing, what coal has done forever, what nuclear has done. There's only two dispatchable fuels that run 24-7. And I'll pr give you a perfect example. You don't want to hear this, but my state has about 90% of it runs on coal. Now, the bottom, I've been who I am all my life, and she was mentioning, I think, and I, I appreciate it, uh, the money that comes through, through contributions into your campaign to get you reelected. The people, if I didn't line up, I didn't change a position from here to there. I've always been for all of the above energy. I've got people mad at me on from the fossil fuel end that says, you're supporting clean energy. I'm supporting everything. I, we need everything. This is, a, this is a, a tremendous country with a tremendous economy that you've got to have fuel to run it. And it has to be dispatchable 24-7. If you want intermittent only, that means what five hours of the day do you want your energy? We're not there yet. We're going to get there. we got batteries now that can give you 100 hours of backup. We never had that before. We're moving, and it's transitioning. You can't stop it overnight and switch. That's the difference. And I know there's people that agree and people that disagree. But I can give you how I look at it, and I don't think there's a conflict at all that people are going to support who they think understands or basically supports positions. Senator. We, we've Senator. Got some other questions. I'm sorry. I'll get yeah, back. So I'll be here. I'll be here. Greetings from East Liverpool, Ohio, Columbia County. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, border. Yeah, you're right across. You're, yeah. part, you're part West Virginia. Right, right. And uh, part of uh, next to Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And as a traditional Ohio Valley Democrat, I want to give you a kudos and an admonishment. I feel like I'm stepping into what just happened, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is that uh, thank you for taking on regulatory reform and trying to make sure that nothing is sacred in terms of how, where, why we live, how we create our energy. All the above, as you just said, yeah. is really important. And that balance of natural resources, and as someone that has also lived that in the public career, the balance, the wise use of our natural resources. Please don't give the extraction side everything they want in your regulatory reform. So my kudos and my admonishment. And no, I my, agree with you. My pressure back to you. Prove to us that you won't give the extraction side everything they want. You and I have lived it. You and I know we can do it the right way. 
but we do need to have that you feel that pressure between a rock and a hard spot. It's, and, not, uh, it's not really, but here's the thing, technology. If it's not feasible, it's not reasonable. No. And you have to have technology. So we have technology right now that we shouldn't be emitting any methane. You know why we were emitting the methane before, while they were drilling and letting all this stuff flare up in the ground in the air? Because they couldn't. The environmentalists took them to court every time, stopped them from building a pipeline to take the methane off. And that's up in the Permian Base. So you wonder up in North Dakota and everything that was going on, why are they allowing all this vetting to go out? Why are they allowing this methane to escape? They couldn't get it to market. So they want us to penalize and shut them down. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. So we're changing things like that. We're making sure that right now, if it wasn't for LNG, what happened? Only, I got kudos for killing the BBB bill, Joe Biden's overreaching bill. And I got eviscerated for doing the IRA, which is an environmental bill. It was my vote. I wrote the damn bill. I know what the bill said. We're going to produce more energy than we ever have in the history of our country, do it better and cleaner, gas, oil, and everything we use in between. And we're going to invest more in cleaner technology than any place in the world. We're going to get there and help the rest of the world get there. But no one was going to follow us. We've got to lead. And that's what we're doing. But it's, uh, it's a tough subject. It's a tough subject matter. It really is. And I want to talk to everybody. We open up. But I'll tell you, they get quite uh, robust. People get quite robust because of their, the, the commitment everyone has. And I, the passion, I appreciate that. The country, this United States of America, turned a blind eye to the, coast, the ghost ships coming out of Iran, shipping oil. Can, when, when they shut us down in America, we weren't producing our own oil enough. But yet, they were hypocritical enough to turn a blind eye and let the ghost ships come out of Iran. They got more resources. They supported more terrorist operations and anything else doing more detriment to humankind than any other country. We knew it was going on. We also needed more oil in the market to keep the prices of gas down. So they let Venezuela back in, the dirtiest, filthiest production of oil in the country, in the world. And then on top of that, they went to Saudi Arabia and begged for two more, two million barrels a day more. And they went backwards. So don't tell me that we're in a situ situation where we're asking, oh, yeah, we're going to be clean and green, but we want somebody else to do our dirty work for us. We yeah. can do it better and cleaner than anybody else in the world. We have time for one question. Thank you. Hello, Senator. Thank you for all the explanations that you're providing, but I do have to bring the topic up again of climate change because I'm in touch with a lot of young people who are in despair about their future. And I'm wondering how you're addressing that. I know that some of the more activist groups like Sunrise and Climate Defiance have actually called you a climate criminal and disrupted some of your events. But there are others who aren't speaking up but who are actually in well, they're terrible. They're not speaking up. They're basically. Uh my question, my question, okay. let me ask the question. What have you done on this tour about America's future to make sure you're reaching out and connecting with young people and hearing what they're saying and what are they saying? We've been going all over to colleges and speaking to reasonable, responsible, respectful young people. The people you just mentioned and those two uh, groups who get very, very uh, animated. They come and they'll be sitting like this and they'll come and they scream and run up here Stop, you can't have a conversation with them. They think they're all right. And I start asking them different questions. Let's sit down and talk. They don't want to talk. They're getting paid to basically harass everybody. I understand what I'm dealing with, and I continue to deal with it. And anytime I want to have a civil conversation, I'm happy to do it. I'm as concerned about climate as anyone else, but I'm concerned about global climate too. I think the rest of the world has a responsibility. China is building and using more energy than any place on earth. India is coming on strong. They're buying more coal and more fossil than any place on Earth because they have an appetite for it. China watches how we became the superpower of the world, and they want to emanate that. So I know what we're dealing with around the world. The Saudis, all of them, what they're producing, Qatar, and, and the LNG that they're producing, sending in New York. So we're dealing with all of that. And they think that we're going to stop it here, and they're going to follow us if we basically quit producing what we need to run this country with the greatest economy. I'm going to make sure that our military has the greatest ability to defend itself and keep the world free. I'm going to make sure this economy is as strong as it can possibly be to defend itself and help the rest of the world. That's the only way you're going to bring the civilized world with you. And uh, it's going to be energy. It is. I wish we had more time. I, we could talk quite a long time, but we have to turn it back over to Deb Hackathorn. Thank you so much, Senator Joe Manchin, Thank for being here. Thank you all. Here. Appreciate it.
Thank you. Well, I hope you found today's special Thursday CMC Forum as interesting as I did. Thank you to WSU Public Media for sponsoring our forum today and to the Ellis for hosting us. Thanks to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. And a very special appreciation to today's speaker, Senator Joe Manchin and our host, Karen Kassler. If I can say one thing. Let, let, me, let me apologize for my dress today because I had a real nice suit I was going to wear. I had a one-way ticket to Cleveland last night, but my garment bag had a round trip back to D.C. <laughs> and I found out late last night that my suit was in D.C. again. So I'm so sorry, but I, that the best I have is what I had left. We are happy to have you, regardless of your attire. <laughs> And if, if you thought today's topic was interesting, please make plans to be here next Wednesday when we talk about high stakes, how legal weed will reshape Ohio. Thanks again to everyone for coming. We could not do this without you. Have a wonderful afternoon.